Good morning and welcome. We're here today to talk about recurring revenue models and how they are taking over the world. My name is Jamie Bertese. I am the COO and president of Tatango. Um, and I have here with me uh, Carlos Casada, the head of customer success and SAP's operations at Aruba, a Hewlett Packard enterprise company. So Carlos, thanks so much for being here. You want to say well, hi to our, and, uh, to our audience? Yeah, good morning, Jimmy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. Uh, look forward to an amazing conversation this morning. Awesome. All right. So let's jump right in. So we're here to talk about recurring revenue business models and they, whether they are or are not taking over the world. We've prepared four topics and we're just going to go jump right in. One of which, of course, is we're going to hear more from Carlos about Aruba and all the things that they've been doing to transform to a scale-up growth organization. So with that, Let's just get right into it. So we're all seeing this, right? Net revenue retention is the big metric. Recurring revenue models have taken over the world and really represent um, scale up growth strategies for companies. Um, people are looking at predictable revenue streams. They really like that, of course. Customers like it. They have a preference for digital experiences. And frankly, the bottom line is folks are seeing higher valuations um, as a result of these kind of revenue models. How about you, Carlos? What are you seeing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just a little bit about um, Aruba, right? So Aruba Networks is the networking arm of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So we consider ourselves the edge business unit. And historically in our traditional business, you know, we've been all about hardware, right? Pushing out um, wireless controllers, wireless access points. And now with the shift, um, one of the new metrics that we see reporting is what the NRR is. And what that's doing is, is it's really moving us from you know, the, the legacy support contract business, which isn't something that you have a whole lot of visibility into, especially because in that model, most companies don't do a good job of maintaining their relationship with the customer. Once the box is sold, the only time you hear from them is when they call in for support. Right. If you shift over to the subscription model, it's really forcing, you know, folks in the customer success space and the customer experience space to really think about how they maintain customers engaged and really ensure that we're delivering that value and the outcome for the customer. And so what that's doing now is it's really forcing us to really understand what is the net revenue retention, right? Net revenue retention uh, takes into consideration customer churn and expansion together, right? And so as we start taking a look at that as a key metric, it's really driving a lot of the initiatives, kind of reverse engineering, what are the different initiatives that the company has to uh, start rolling out in order to be able to improve this NMR. So, you know, absolutely. And then I think one of the key things I'm seeing is at least uh, on the HPE side, one of the things that we have stood up over the past couple of years is our, our, our intent to make all of our products available as a service. And so with right. that, um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, this new shift in, in, in hardware as a consumption model. Right. Um, so that's really driving a lot. And what that happened, what ends up doing is this as a service concept is now forcing you know, service product line management to really be the tip of spear and product roadmap and product definition. So a lot of the features historically used to be developed by product management to go in and then services would figure out how they would build a service around it. We're now starting to see a little bit of a shift where now service product management is going back and saying, here's what features we need in the product, such as instrumentation and telemetry to really go and deliver this thing as a service. Yeah, totally. All right, so let's jump right into a little bit more on that. These, some of these topics. I think everybody in the audience, I'm sure, is trying to figure out benchmarks for themselves, right? Their company, how are they doing? Are they keeping up? Are you a la are you a leader? Are you a laggard? You know, what are you doing here? And really, what we're seeing these days is that there's a what group that we would call customer success pace setters, really, who are leading the way. And these are the kind of metrics that I think that uh, we try and we should all be trying to benchmark ourselves against trying to achieve uh, net revenue retention over 120%. 125% is an amazing statistic, fabulous, fabulous business there. Driving fantastic growth, 10X growth, really achieving these super, super low churn rates. And these things are possible. And um, you know, it's something that uh, folks are really striving for and, I, and we're seeing these pay setters really leading the way to, uh, to make happen. But the problem that we see is that there are a lot of choke points, right? And you know, when you're really trying to move forward aggressively, transitioning, as Carlos was describing with his company, with Aruba, um, you know, you got to make sure that you're identifying these choke points and you're kind of 
eliminating the choke points, right? Because if you aren't, there's just no way you're going to be able to really scale up and move to an operating model that delivers those kind of benchmarks that we were just discussing. So, you know, most organizations that we see are not really well equipped to scale up and to deliver here. Most of them are really um, delivering, I would say, suboptimal experiences for their company or for their customers. I think pretty inconsistent experiences, pretty unreliable experiences. Oftentimes, maybe the responses to customers are too low or too slow, sorry, or are, um, you know, also uh, maybe just incorrect. Um, they're really reactive, right, to customers. They're not really driving the customer forward. They're more kind of sitting back waiting for the customer to come to them and ask a problem. And many of the organizations we see have workflow gaps or just plain old organization, organizational lethargy, right? Someone like HPE, Carlos's organization, huge, huge company, and making some of these shifts is pretty tough. So, Carlos, what are you seeing? I mean, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, as I take a look at the slide, I would say, you know, some of the, some of the, uh, chug points that I think are more significant is when you look at this slide, I think there's certain areas in here that I think as a customer success leader, I kind of can control and I have a little bit more say in. Mm -hmm. It's those choke points that are outside of my organization. So I would definitely align with the organizational lethargy. Um, one other KPI that I would also add to the earlier slide is, which has helped us tremendously in our go-to-market and our business model as we engage with other groups is you know the lowering of the customer acquisition costs, right? Um, and that's really how we go in and we and we essentially build our business case. And so what I would say for, for, for the folks in the audience, the customer success leaders, is the way that you get beyond some of this is um, you know bring bringing some of the other groups into the overall vision of CS early is super important. One of the things that we did very early on is as we were standing up our charter is we would go and identify who the key stakeholders across the company were and then bringing them in to give us feedback on our charter, giving them a little bit a, a bit more perspective as to why we were doing this and what the goal was. And as they give us feedback on, on defining our charter, kind of subconsciously or indirectly, they're actually signing up to support this. And right. so that to us was huge. We right. yeah. into, our, into our repetitive motion. So as we're standing up new capabilities, bringing in those stakeholders and making them part of the solution versus part of the problem has actually helped uh, break down one of those big uh, friction points for us. Yeah, so that, I think that's great. I mean, I think there's no leader out there who doesn't really want to um, be driving, you know, fantastic growth, achieving those kind of benchmarks, um, lowering customer acquisition costs, so forth for their company. But, you know, the questions are like, how do we do this? How do we achieve this? And I think that there's some things that we can say, okay, let's not do that, right? So, you know, let's not try some of the folks, some of the things that we've kind of listed out here for you. Um, first of all, let's not try force fitting the CRM to drive this kind of growth. It's just, it's not made to do that. It's not really going to work. I don't think bringing on some kind of monolithic customer success platform is going to work. Um, I think that uh, it's just too heavy a lift, takes forever. It's going to be very difficult to kind of make changes and iterate and move fast as you really have to, if you want to eliminate these choke points. I think that, um, you know, bringing on tools that don't necessarily scale up Maybe uh, something that's, uh, you know, kind of a cheap point solution or like a, I would call it like some of the modern tools that are out there that are just kind of like band-aids for one little piece of thing are going to work as well. So, you know, I think it's it's a quite a challenge to try and figure out, okay, all right, I want to hit these numbers. I want to be able to drive 10x growth. I want to have single digit, you know, low churn. I want to be able to drive uh, these fabulous net revenue retention numbers for my company and I want to be able to deliver a fantastic valuation, right? Move forward in my career. Um, so if this is not what I'm supposed to do, what am I supposed to do, right? So Carlos, did you ever think about any of these op options here on the table? Have you had any experience evaluating this stuff? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would say one of the recommendations I would give to the CS leaders here, my colleagues, is that you know um, you, you are the master of your domain and nobody understands this space in the company better than you. Um, you know, one of the things that I ran into very early on as I was trying to go in and, 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 and you know, um, drive more efficiencies and, and actually build automation is I got that very, that very response. Well, why aren't you doing this in SFPC? Why aren't you doing this? And like, it sounds like what you're asking to do can be done in this other system. And that's where I think as a CS leader, that's kind of your defining moment of how passionate are you about what you're trying to accomplish? Because let's be real. Um, most of our subscriptions are going to at a very minimum be a one-year subscription, which means that anything that you do 
it's going to take a while for it to proliferate before you can see the outcome. And so if you have to go in and embed yourself into some of these other platforms that you're now waiting in line because other company, other groups in the company are also using them and you may not be a priority, you're trying to get features and workflows built in, it's going to take a while before you can actually drive some of that 10x growth that you're talking about. And so for us, very early on, we took a digital first approach to customer success. And what that meant is we needed to make sure that we started off on the right foot. And so to your point, yeah, I was confronted with, well, why don't you do this in SFDC? Well, SFDC doesn't do these other things. Well, why don't you do this in Monday.com? Well, Monday.com doesn't do these other things. Right. I needed a purpose-built solution that was going to go in and drive the automation and the engagement that I needed for my team. And I couldn't start off with spreadsheets because at the time I had such a big install base that I would still need a human to deliver whatever was on a spreadsheet. And so absolutely, I think a lot of these touch points here I think we find ourselves um, trying to really band-aid solutions together to kind of get us to the next point. But it's one of those things like it's like, you know, I've heard that term or a quote where it's like, if you don't have time to do it now, you're not going to have time to do it twice later. Right. So start off right. on the right foot, yeah. go and, 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 and yeah, yeah, you know, really be passionate and, and hold your line about, you know, what is it you're trying to accomplish and make sure that you're not being force fit into round hole, uh, square, square peg type of thing. Exactly. And I think it's, you know, it's honestly, I think it's a bit more than that. So, I mean, you know, the other thing I would say, if we take a look at this next slide that we have here is that you really have to reorient your operating model as a company. So I think traditionally, many of us have been in the mode where we're all about acquisition. Okay, let's just get this customer, win the logo, bring them in, right? So in a really kind of acquisition focused, buy load approach, marketing goes and does this and sales goes and does this and services goes and does this and CS does that and support does this. But frankly, that doesn't work in the model uh, that we're talking about here with a really high growth operating model that you're striving to build. If you want to, in today's digital first world, which, you know, Carlos, of course, is talking about here, you got to move to a model where you have a really customer value driven approach. Right. And that sounds kind of like lofty and hard. Like, how am I going to get to a customer value driven approach? Like, what does that actually even really mean? And I think what it means is that you have to make sure that each, you know, each piece of the organization, every part of the company, whether it's the sales org, the marketing org, the CS org, they're working together in orchestration for that customer to make sure that they're delivering for the customer from the initial sale and throughout the lifetime. And it might even be in the pre sales mode. I mean, one of the things we see is that from the very first moment that we interact with a potential customer, we're driven, drive, driving value, value, value for that customer, whether it's um, before they've signed the contract or after they've signed the contract. There's really no difference if you want to actually maintain that customer for the lifetime. So I think, Carlos, everyone would love to hear more from you specifically about how you guys have, have approached this at Aruva and really moved into this kind of value-driven, customer value-driven uh, mindset. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think you hit it spot on. You know, one of the one of the uh, I would say I don't want to say cliche terms, but I'll, I'll say that is we've heard this concept of customer success as a philosophy, not a department. And in that slide that you were just sharing, one of the things that that we've adopted is that you know customer success is really this umbrella, and it's really defining the internal workflows that need to happen to drive whatever customer experience we're trying to deliver, right? right? And one of the trends that I see now that you mentioned on this is what I call shifting left, meaning that, you know, yeah. in many organizations, customer success has already done a pretty decent job into defining what onboarding looks like and what the experience that we're trying to deliver for customers. But then when we go into the pre-sales motion, much of that discipline doesn't exist. And so what yeah. is I'm starting to see is more and more CS organizations shifting left and sharing the best practices. And to your point, it really drives that consistent experience. So why not give a customer an amazing onboarding experience even before they purchase? Because that's just a precursor of what they can experience after they convert, right? And so absolutely, I've always looked at customer success as this umbrella. And underneath that umbrella, you have everything from pre-sales to onboarding to training to support to renewals, right, to enablement. And so um, what we've done is we've actually built out what I call an as a service operation team. And part of that function is driving the journey mapping that yeah. needs to happen so that every group in the delivery knows what their responsibility is to deliver their piece during that phase of the customer. And so that's how we've kind of taken the approach of ensuring the customer is getting value and determining what are the KPIs that we track along each one of those phases. Right. So let's look at it more. So let, why don't we go right in here? So you were going to tell us a little bit more about what happened with your some of your stories around the pandemic, huh? Yeah, yeah. So great, uh, great segue there. So 
you know, uh, just a little bit of history. You know, when I started at Aruba, we didn't have a customer success program, so there was no organizational debt. Um, this actually got birthed out of the fact that we had started selling subscription uh, subscription products and subscription services, but we've been treating it a lot like um, the perpetual business. And so uh, right before the pandemic, we would already started building out our digital engagement. We started actually uh, piloting and incubating this concept of CSM-led engagements. We identified portfolios of customers and we're starting to get to the point where we're doing MBRs and QBRs and customer success plans and all this. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and it just seemed very insensitive for my CSMs to be reaching out to people at that time, trying to schedule you know, their monthly sync up or their MBR or their CSP. Um, and so we decided to take a step back and really pause that, you know, typical uh, customer success manager engagement. And at the time, you know, Aruba um, had solutions that historically um, hadn't been used as much because this remote workforce thing wasn't as popular. Um, and what we realized is we had this huge opportunity to really help our customers. And so leveraging the access that we had to our install base, we actually turned our, turned our, our, our view into rather than trying to help customers with their CSPs, let's help them on how they can do business continuity with the solution they already have. So many of these organizations already had remote access points. Um, you know, how can we go and support the remote workforce? And so we pivoted leveraging our digital engagement, leveraging the relationships we built to really help customers take advantage of some of the free equipment they were giving out, some of the free licenses yeah. that we're giving out and really driving that engagement. And what ended up happening is that's actually how we birthed our, 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 what would I call our CSM swarm model. So, right. you know, we actually use Calendly in a lot of our digital engagements. And so for every one of these messages that we were saying now on how you can leverage this business continuity offer we had, we had an option for customers to click on a Calendly can schedule a call with us to help them through it. And what we found is it was really effective because customers could save that email and maybe request the call a week or two from now, once they better understood how they could leverage this. And so that's really how um, our SWARM model was birthed, and we've actually now maintained that. We no longer necessarily hold a portfolio of customers for CSM. We've shifted to more a, um, a opportunistic CSM engagement, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but you know, our digital engagement uh, uh, is, is kind of the foundation, and then we build on top of that. And what that's allowed us to do is really do a lot better resource management, right? We can actually take a look at where the install base is, what the segmentation looks like, and we can actually throttle um, some of the CSM engagement based on the need, right? And and the cool part is, is with the automation that we have built into Tango, we can continue keeping a pulse on the customer. The messaging that's going to the customer is contextual and timely. So it's very personal, but it also gives us an opportunity to really take a view as to, uh, um, you know, what the install base is doing and how we should engage. Yeah. The thing is, is that really strikes me from everything you're saying, it's so consistent with some of the earlier uh, discussion, which is about delivering that customer value, right? And so... You know, at one point you were thinking, okay, customer value means that we want to offer them, say, onboarding programs, pre-onboarding programs before they even buy, right? But then the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, you decided the first customer value we were going to bring was something else entirely different, right? Because of this life event that we all went through. And, you know, you, you as you say, you were feeling like uh, it would be insensitive to just kind of go through kind of business as usual, right? So you obviously had to have some mechanism to be able to pivot super quickly, and to be able to change things really on the fly and very quickly that you and your team could actually move forward with. Because if you had gone with one of those other approaches we talked about in the past, there, the kind of monolithic approach or the force fitting the CRM, you would have been beholden to a whole other team to make these changes to your program, which obviously would not have worked yeah. for you in terms of delivering that customer value. So I think that was super smart. Yeah. Okay, let yeah. me move on for you here. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and just to expand on that, right? Um, so to your point, right, um, we, because of um, our ability to engage with our customers, whether digital or through CS-led engagements, yeah. we've now kind of become the go-to organization within the company to reach out to our install base whenever there's a message that needs to be delivered, right? Awesome, have, yeah, of course. Comms team. That's our marketing. <laughs> Absolutely, right? And so we've always had a really good relationship with marketing from the very beginning. But how do we do this, right? Um, again, how do we go in and manage the swarm team? So just as a context, these numbers here are just for illustration purposes, but I wanted to make sure I painted this picture, right? Right now, um, we're, we're a global organization and we're managing somewhere over about 14,000 accounts, you know, somewhere over $100 million with the portfolio value there. Um, and so I don't have a team of 30 CSMs, right? In reality, I have a team of eight CSMs. And so with eight CSMs, we're managing this install base many of which 90 about 94 percent of the install base is tech touch right 
And so we lean very, very heavily on the automation. But what you see here is we, we've created the ability, thanks to the, to the tool that we're using right with the Tango and everything, where we can actually in one eye shot understand what the current status of the install base is. So at any point in time, I, I can understand how many customers I have in which phase of the journey. And then also, um, you know, is the customer currently on track, off track or at risk? And right. these are the types of views that allow us to determine, do I need to engage digitally or do I need to engage to a CSM led motion? We we're talking about ARR a little bit earlier, right? So when you have this view on the far right, you can also see that not only do I have customers going to onboarding adoption, but through all of these motions, what does my expansion and churn look like, right? And taking that step further, when you aggregate expansion and churn, that's NRR, right? Yeah. And so this is kind of the view that I would walk into if I'm going to give an executive overview of what's the product, how's the product doing, what's it looking like? Yeah. And so taking that a step further, when we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. how do I operationalize this? Well, check this view out, right? So if I have, if I don't have an indefinite number of resources, where do I spend time? Which none of us do, Carlos, by the way. None of us do. We're all here. Yeah. And so the idea is, is creating a view like this helps me and the team quickly go in and figure out what's the strategy, right? And I made some obvious points here. So on the bottom right, you can see that I have nine customers in my high-tech segment that represent $5.2 million. I could probably go after that in a high touch model, right? Yeah. But on the far left, I have a little bit under a million dollars across 700. What's the digital emotion I got to drive there, right? Okay. So it's, it's this type of thought process and it's this type of view that we've been able to deliver based on the automation and picking that non-monolithic tool that allows us to quickly go in and create targeted email campaigns, create tasks for the CSMs to go deliver, right? What are the playbooks that need to be activated here? So, you know, Combining this with where the customer is in the journey, we can now send very contextual tasks to the CSMs or yeah. digital messages to the customers to go in and drive the behavior that we need to be driven. Right. And I guess if nothing, we if we've learned nothing, everything uh, during the pandemic, it's that, you know, to expect the unexpected. We have no idea. Right. We've yeah. got to be able to iterate, got to be able to change the, the competitive landscape that we're all in changes constantly as well, too. Yeah, right? The only consistency is change for sure. Yes, exactly. Okay. Let me just go ahead. Yeah, and just to close on this, right? So I walked you through at a high level how we track the install base going through a different journey. I also demonstrated the heat map of you know how we keep an eye on the install base based on the segmentation. Now we talk about well, what's the delivery model look like? And so what I wanted to demonstrate on this slide is that if you take a look, the orange, uh, the orange highlights here really represent digital engagement. These are non-human interactions that go out to customers automatically. And what I want to demonstrate is that the low touch or the tech touch engagement model actually serves as a foundation for all of our engagement models. Right. And what this does is it creates that consistent look and feel. So right out of the tool, customers will get the same welcome letter, whether you're a tech touch or a high touch customer. Right. What we do is that we then add human elements or human touch points as you go mm -hmm. up with this, right? And over the past number of years, we've actually had the opportunity to really grow this to the point where we now have monetized customer success offers. And what we've done is we've embedded the customer success manager as part of the delivery of some of our advanced service programs. And so as you go up this pyramid, what you find is that some of those higher touch engagements are actually now migrating over to revenue opportunities because we're selling now right. service programs that are embedded. But you still get the same look and feel as somebody who's you know just part of a standard subscription package. That's right. And so that so you're driving expansion, you're driving customer value. I mean, you know, it's really great all towards that growth model um, and the NRR model that we're all looking for. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then how we do this just very quickly, you know, very early on, as many of uh, my CS colleagues here can imagine, there's a lot of work to be done when you first get started. You don't know where to start. And we were spinning for a couple of months. It's like, we, we do this, but what about this? And are we going to go after new customers or existing customers? What about customers that are coming up for renewal? What are we going to do for them? And we just could never pick where to start. And so we knew we had to do something, and we need to do something now. So we actually adopted this concept of the minimal viable product or um, the minimal viable program, which was really around, you know, what can we do in the next three months? And when we create this concept of an MVP, as I, as I show here, it really gave us that clarity and focus of what we knew we were going to do in the next three months, knowing there was going to be things we weren't going to address, sure. but we were conscious about that, Yeah. right? And so in the next slide, we actually demonstrate, we can talk about really what that looks like, right? And this is going to be a little bit different for everybody, but one of the things I want to call out is, you know, one of the things that we've been able to establish is I kind of have this bench. I call it the incubation bench. And what this team does is this team is, is, is essentially 
in charge of going and identifying some of the new capabilities that need to be developed. And we can go and pilot them and test them out. And then once they've been, once once that pilot's completed, then we can move it over operationalized. So what this means, I talked about earlier about getting the stakeholders involved early on. So yeah. as an example, when we first decided that we we're going to do this, we did discovery, right? What does the install base look like? You know, do I have tier, you know, tier one or tier three customers? What are we going to go after? What's that model going to look like? So we made some very key decisions and we shared that charter with the stakeholders initially. Once we got sign off, then we said, well, what are the things in that in that in that initiative that we're going to drive? That's where we got into user story creation. For anybody who's been in program management before, right? This is an agile framework. We do follow the agile me me methodology. So as you go through all these different steps, the idea here is at the end of the three month uh, cycle or at the end of the three month, what we call um, uh, a delivery, you have two choices. We actually move to operationalize and whatever out, you know, the output of this here is actually the customer journey, right? One of the things that Guy talks about is that the customer journey is the product of customer success. And so this right. is exactly what this means, meaning that at the, at, by the time we wrap this up, we now have the journey maps, we have the playbooks, we have the tasks, we've identified how we're going to calculate the customer's health during that phase. And then the green arrow is, let's go put that into Tango. Now, the, the 6B is, let's go look at our backlog and what are the things that we actually put off? How much of that can we take on in the next cycle, the next iterate? So this is something we've been doing now for about three years, and it's really helped us tremendously in removing a lot of the noise, getting rid of some of the distractions, and creating this really efficiency in the ongoing development of our program. Yeah, it's amazing. Such great work. Yeah, and so when I take a look at, um, you know, now that we've gone and developed the MVP, so we talked about how we monitor the install base. Then we talked about, well, how are we going to, what are we going to do, right? How are we going to engage them? And that's where we talk about MVP and this, the strategy and all that. Mm -hmm. This is where, you know, the rubber meets the road. Now, how do we go in and operationalize this, right? right. And this is where I feel like a tool like the Tango really helped us really be, um, uh, uh, really be successful because, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that you may not use right away, but I feel like the solution really grew with us. So initially, right. we were very heavy on just using Tatango for our digital engagement. Then we started going and let's leverage it for segmentation. Let's leverage it for account health visually, and all that other stuff, right? And now, you know, with like with the work that, that you guys have done in creating the templates, we're now even driving more efficiency and automation, right? You know, we already have, um, you know, our concept or our or, or framework for what a CSP looks like creating those templates and having them automatically created for our digital customers is huge. You know, saving time from a CSM perspective to go and create these PowerPoints and delivering, right? Um, the action-based triggers are something that we adopted very, very early on. This is how we engage with customers as they go from green to red to, to yellow to red, right? Right. And then the segmentation, uh, we just announced our global partner program. So that's something that I'm also very proud of. Um, about a month and a half ago, we announced our partner success program. And the partner success program, we actually have partners that are actually sitting in our instance to Tango. And we've created a segmentation for each partner so they can have the view of their install base and drive CS on our behalf. That's just another example of how the tool continues to allow us to branch out scale and drive some of that innovation. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you know, we used to do our journey maps in PowerPoint. Right. And so as we did a lot of the work with regards to bringing the stakeholders together and starting to, you know, map out, well, what should happen during onboarding and what is the uh, what is the action that needs to be taken? Do we need to create a playbook? Do we need to create a template? Right. A lot of that work was being done kind of out of the tool. And, you know, now with the, with the launch of Canvas, it's pretty awesome that it's still it can now be maintained. And one of the things that Canvas has allowed us to do is, you know, for anybody who on the call who's familiar with the Tango or, or any of these tools, you run the risk of actually having creating workflows or rules that, ca that cancel each other out. And so now with the build out of the canvas, we can actually see visually and make sure that, you know, any of the workflows or automation that we built in are actually firing and that they're not canceling each other out. We don't have any rule conflict. So this is actually continued to allow us to keep most of our work, if not all of our work, all within one central location, as opposed to having the journey map sitting over over in, in PowerPoint, and then our administrator trying to figure out how to translate those into um, into Tango. And then lastly, my CS leaders now, my CS delivery teams now have the ability to on the fly go in and create their own kind of on-demand um, engagements based on what they're seeing um, live. Right. 
Yeah, so I also, I actually run the customer success team at Tatango here too. And I will tell you that Canvas uh, and a lot of the best practice templates and all the stuff that's built in have made our lives easy, super easier as well. We used to do the exact same thing. And now the, the beauty of Tatango with Canvas, the, the beauty of it is that every time you want to look and see what your journey is, it's 100% accurate for you, right? There's never a time where you've made a decision and somebody hasn't made an update on one of the slides or something like that. So it's kind of, you know, inaccurate and you can move things around right there and actually uh, make decisions, design and run kind of all in one, um, which we find to be super, super help, super, super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to close, just want to give an example, right? So one of the things with our digital engagement, we actually personified our digital engagement. We created a fictitious character named Steve, who's our virtual CSM. And so what you're seeing here on the screen is, um, essentially what, what that Steve engagement looks like. So although we have human-led CSM engagements, we also have uh, digital engagements as well. So this is just an example of what that looks like, and all this is powered through the same platform. Awesome. Should I click on this little play button, or is it just a picture? I think it's just a picture. Okay, got it. Oh, yes, meaning you sent it as a video. Perfect. All right. So all this stuff that Carlos and team are doing, as you guys can see, is like super uh, innovative, interesting. They're constantly improving, constantly um, iterating their program, thinking about what they're learning from their MVP approach, operationalizing what they're learning, taking the good stuff, moving it into the full on CS program, driving expansion, driving um, you know, value for the customers like we talked about kind of from day one. And really to do that, this requires for you to be able to execute like this. It does require you to have a proven growth platform. And our composable customer success platform at Tatango is purpose built to, to uh, deliver in this type of situation. So first of all, the first thing you gotta know is that our composable customer success platform is the only one in the world. The only one like this that exists. It delivers flexibility, it delivers embedded intelligence, it's super, super easy to get started, like uh, Carlos mentioned, even when he got started. Now he's got eight CSMs and boatloads of customers, as you guys can see. He would not be able to deliver, you know, all of this, all the stuff that he's talking about without like a fleet of CSMs, unless he actually had some technology that was kind of working with him, allowing him to be able to iterate, improve, make decisions and move on, right? to be able to optimize those customer outcomes and deliver that customer value like we've talked about. So what is a composable customer success platform? This might be kind of a new term for people. I'm not really sure how much folks are staying up on these kinds of terms, but what are the key components? The first thing that I think is important to understand is this modular. So Tatango comes out of the box as a component of our customer success platform. Uh, with pre-built templates. We call these things customer success blocks or success blocks. And these are journeys and uh, CS programs that are mixed and matchable. They're pre-built, ready to go for you. And this is why we find that customers are able to get up and running very, very quickly, like Carlos mentioned, um, whether they're very uh, early stage companies or super savvy. Um, when Carlos was getting started, I mean, HPE, huge, big company, right, Aruba, Carlos, but you guys were still pretty early on in terms of the the uh, migration to kind of customer success and so Absolutely. forth, right? Also, another key component of a composable customer success platform is a unified design and run approach. You don't design someplace else and then come, come run it here. You design and run everything all in one, very easily, very quickly, moving things around exactly as you would want to do. So you're just time saving and things are always accurate. Um, you have to be very customer experience led. It has to be an outcome first gets uh, designed. You want to get started day one. No long implementation period where you have to bring in your IT resources and do all this stuff that's going to be super difficult for most of us, right? Mere mortals need to be able to stand this stuff up day one. Also, as I mentioned, you know, the best practices already, you've got to have that multidimensional customer view. You want to have unified visibility of what's going on with the customer across all stages, across all data, but you want to see only the relevant data, the current data. You need to see every single thing about the customer. You want to see what's going on for this particular moment, like Carlos was showing us with his red, yellow, and green and by journey stage um, and, uh, you know, in terms of uh, churn stage, et cetera. 
Um, also, I think that you really want to make sure that you've got uh, friction-free orchestration. And what this really kind of comes down to is that you've got shared participation across the organization, like we talked about. You cannot have something that is just acquisition-oriented. Your org has to be designed to deliver customer value across the company. So everybody, even from the first moment that you're touching that customer, they're getting value. And I think these are the things that these customer success pay setters that we're working with, these you know, really strong leaders that they're able to achieve. And these are the companies that are really going places. So what's in it for you guys? Why should you care? Why should you think about all this? Well, you know, you really need to um, uh, think about where you wanna go. What kind of goals do you wanna achieve? Our composable customer success platform supports your needs across all three of these pillars. Value day one, you can continuously iterate like, how, like uh, Carlos was mentioning. And then you, you, know, you can predictably scale up your business and grow. Um, you can bring the right balance of human and automation and you can set, you know, get better kind of every single day um, as you move forward, whether that's from the best practices that are included or uh, from the community contributions or the training programs that are included. It's all about mixing and matching with a composable customer success platform. We, we like to say your CS, your way. All right. So how do you become what we call a scale up winner, right? What do you really actually need to do? And the thing I like to tell people about this is just start wherever you are. You do not have to figure every single thing out before you get started. You can start very quickly and easily, no matter what your um, experience level, what your size of organization or your complexity level. So we have customers who are very, very small, just a, you know, like a small number of customer success folks on their team, or maybe they're a company of 25 employees with 100 customers, all the way up to the largest in the world. And um, it doesn't matter with a composable customer success platform that Tatango brings to you. Frankly, uh, you know, you can just iterate as you go and bring in the building blocks and compose what it is you're trying to do. There's no reason to have to cre recreate the wheel or actually um, figure everything out before you get going. And this has been, when I talk to customers about this who are you know, kind of on the other side of everything here, delivering these, these pace setters, delivering these fabulous results and NRR over 120% and so forth, this is what they speak to. The fact that they didn't have to figure everything out, they could just get started and then as they got going and they were delivering value to the customers, delivering value to their organizations, they could do more and do more and do more as Carlos has, uh, has um, uh, been mentioning. So what do you think, Carlos? Any last uh, words of advice for our, uh, for our customer or our audience here? No, I think, I think, like I said, like I mentioned earlier on, be passionate. I think it's important to understand that this is an iterative, iterative approach. You're never done. Um, and, you know, one of the things I love about the customer success community is everybody's really willing to share. So I think a lot of stuff that, that you talked about today, I think is, is uh, something that a lot of the folks are going to find very, very valuable. And, you know, I think, um, you know, any of us are always uh, open to discuss more and, and, and share what we've done. Absolutely. For sure, you can email me or Carlos. I'm jamie at tatango.com. And um, also, uh, the other thing you can do is you can start free now. One of the other beautiful things about our, our composable customer success platform is that um, anybody can start free. You don't need to do anything. Just go to the website, sign up, check it all out, start using it, and see what you think. You know, well, Jamie, if I could add to that, one of the things that we did is we actually leveraged that as well. So, um, mm -hmm. as part of uh, some acquisitions that we had, um, you know, we actually started some of the other groups that were joining us with the free version, right? Rather than having them be part of our existing instance, mm -hmm. we had them go in and get familiar and, and kind of kick the tires of it to come get used to the framework that we had built. And so mm -hmm. giving them their version of the platform to initially get started and get them on board was yeah. very easy to help transition them over into the into the operational platform as well. So yeah. you don't have to be a new customer. You can use it within your organization for some absolutely. of the other groups as well. Yes, absolutely. Totally, totally agree. All right. All right, Carlos, thanks so much for your time, your insights. I loved it. I think the work you guys are doing is amazing. And I want to encourage everybody else to come on board um, you know, we're here at uh, TSAA. You can come check out our booth. We, I guess, have some free socks to give away to you guys. Plus, on top of that, 
uh, tickets to Disney World. So come on by and check out our composable customer success platform at Tatango. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody.